Good morning, good day, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the third installment of our Farmer to Farmer Knowledge Sharing Webinar hosted by the Gumin Foundation. My name is Michael Pascual, and I, and I am the senior recruiter for Gumin Foundation's Farmer to Farmer program here in the Philippines. Uh, and I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar. Grameen Foundation's mission is to enable the poor, especially women, to end poverty and hunger. And our breakthroughs are in digital financial services, digital innovation for agriculture, and health financing and access. In July of 2019, we implemented the capacity building of the coconut subsector through Farmer to Farmer, which is implemented by uh, uh, USAID, uh, which is uh, uh, funded by USAID, and it's a technical assistance uh, in developing, it offers technical assistance in developing countries. The farmer to farmer capacity building of the coconut subsector, also known as F2F COCOS, is a technical assistance program that aims to improve the coconut subsector's uh, profitability, productivity, and access to financial services. The goals for today's webinar are to share experiences of one of our uh, host partners, Glamco, represented by their manager, Glenn Mar Sumagaisai from, uh, and farmer to farmer uh, volunteer, uh, Matthew Bonapane. They will be highlighting key takeaways on how to streamline the capacities of farmer, uh, farming cooperatives during the pandemic. And of course, promote collaboration between stakeholders and the volunteers toward the attainment of resilience within the coconut subsector. We're, we are glad to have participants from the private sector, local and international NGOs, the academe, we also have Andrew Escolona from Mano, Mano Legao, uh, Pagasa Youth Club of Carmen, Agusan del Norte. Also, we have Ashi, Community uh, Crafts Association of the Philippines, Baco Deco, Don Bosco, BTI Besmed, Friend Foundation, and representatives from USAID, including uh, Jay DeQueros from USAID Philippines Mission. In, uh, we also have Shims Batong from the Office of Economic Development and Governance. And we are glad to have uh, Kelly McNally from the Partners of the Americas, uh, ABA. Representing Grameen Foundation are Judith Agnuleto, Country Director of Farmer to Farmer Cocos, and she'll be sharing more about the Farmer to Farmer program. We also have Christine Villago, Country Manager of Grameen Foundation Philippines, and she'll be leading today's panel discussion. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping reminders. Uh, the duration of today's webinar is one hour and 30 minutes. And uh, please be mindful of uh, folks from the other countries uh, since they have, they're in different time zones. Um, also, English is not the first language for some of our participants. So please speak clearly and slowly. The webinar is also being recorded and will be available after the event. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to type them into the chat box and we'll be happy to address them during the questions and answers portion of the webinar. And we'll also be sharing contact information with all participants after the webinar. Again, welcome, and I'll now be turning it over to Judith to talk about the Farmer to Farmer program. Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Judith Anileto. I am Grameen Foundation's Country Director of the F2F COCOS program in the Philippines. Welcome to our exciting discussion today. I saw several names in the list of participants. We thank you so much for, for coming in today. So I hope you enjoy and learn new things today. So I'd like to share with you that F2F supports farmers in developing countries to improve livelihood and food security. Um, US-based volunteers are sent on technical assignments to provide hands-on training to communities and various types of organizations. So they could be cooperatives, agribusinesses, microfinance, educational institutions, and others. Even during the pandemic, F2F finds ways to do its mission of generating sustainable, broad-based economic growth in the agriculture sector. Last year, the program celebrated its 35th year of global implementation and looks forward to more years of service. So in the Philippines, our focus is, is on the coconut subsector. In the past year, um, as I have mentioned earlier, given the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, technical assistance is being done remotely or a local volunteer is paired with a U.S.-based volunteer. 
For now, some of the technical assistance done and on or ongoing are on improving financial management, market research, business and strategic planning, marketing and promotion, cacao product development, and e-commerce. These are selected mainly by the host organization seeking technical assistance. And we try to match this need with the expertise of volunteers that we find uh, from the US. So this year until 2023, we are working to deliver as much technical assistance as possible to qualified host organizations. So we have partnered with several organizations in Southern Tagalog, in the Bicol region, Eastern Visayas, and also parts of Mindanao. And we have received positive feedback from these organizations and communities. F2F technical assistance perfectly drives and strengthens other assistance that they receive from other groups, from private or government entities. So uh, I thank you for joining and I hope we can provide you new insights today. So that's it for me today and back to you, Micah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judith, for sharing more about the Farmer to Farmer program. And for those who are interested, we are happy to share more information after the webinar. At this time, we'll give the floor over to Christine, who will be leading the panel discussion. Thank you, Michael. My name is Christine Villalago, Country Manager of Grooming Foundation here in the Philippines. I thank each one of you for joining us in our session today. So before we begin and introduce our um, speakers this morning, I'd like to give you a COVID-19 pandemic situation here in the Philippines. As you know, it has affected a lot of our businesses as well as our partner organizations in both the agriculture and financial services sector. The cases of COVID-19 have been increasing um, in the Philippines for the past few weeks. And that, and that is because of the Delta variant that has been present in the communities, both in the Metro Manila, um, rural and urban areas. The Delta variant is, um, transmission is quite fast and that has brought us to one of the, probably one of the strictest lockdowns in Southeast Asia. And we are now actually in um, the second uh, strict community quarantine um, starting in August and has been extended in September time. The number of cases as of August 31 are um, close to 2 million, so 1.9 million um, as, of, as of yesterday. And actually, sad to read the news this morning, um, we don't go down uh, in 10,000 numbers um, for the past few weeks in active cases. This has also resulted, of course, in slowing down of businesses, slow transportation or limited movement across um, communities, and of course, loss of jobs in some of our um, institutions, both at the service sector, agriculture, and many more. The vaccination rate in the country is about 12.7% as recorded uh, by One World in data this August and distributed through local government units. So it's really up to the local government to push and recommend and register new um, new uh, folks who are adults in, in the working sector to be vaccinated. Based on the updated study, of course, of Grameen Foundation, COCO's team, and the impact of COVID-19 on host organizations this March, the safety and the security of members and customers remains to be the highest priority. The second priority is to improve business operations while ensuring continuity and of course, the third, to maintain business liquidity. Business growth, although important, of course, for a lot of our um, partner organizations was not considered as urgent during the pandemic. Most of the host organizations are seeking farmer to farmer cocoa support in setting the direction of the organizations, identifying new products and services, and enhancing the skills and knowledge of members through the sir, sir. training. Sir, done. Our projects are targeted to Salawa sa pasir kayo di. Kadali di. Black down. Yuter. So now I will now invite two of our panelists to join our discussion. Our first panelist is Mr. Glenn Mar Sumagaysay, 
Operations Manager of Grow Lamco Multipurpose Cooperative, who has dedicated his managerial expertise with Lamco for almost two decades now. And now you have the floor. Glenn, we now have the floor to speak. Hello, good morning, good evening to each and every one of us. I am uh, Glenn Mars Tubagaysay of Grow Lambo Multipurpose Cooperative. Uh, I am now uh, currently the operations manager of this cooperative. Uh, currently, I am 12 years as a manager and six years as an account officer still in our Grow Lambo Multipurpose Cooperative. Uh, I am here to present uh, to this webinar session about our learnings and experiences in the farmer to farmer program of Grameen Foundation that is very patient and persistent to us along with this program. So we thank you the men and women of Grameen Foundation. So as a cooperative uh, nowadays, uh, uh, this cooperative is a people's organiz organization benefited from a community driven project held by the Japanese organization uh, called CCWA or the Christian Child Welfare Association back in early 80s and mid 90s. So this organization uh, do have this culture of satisfying the needs of every members. So we make sure that every step we take, uh, we can satisfy every member of the cooperative. As a young cooperative before, it started to lend money to the members with a grant capital from the mother organization or from the CCWA. The management strived to use the fund to cater the members' needs. It started with uh, only 41 original cooperators who believed that uh, what the mother organization or the CCWA had started, which is to help every members should be continued by the next generation of cooperative leaders and members. Through the years of developing the services, we experienced uh, difficulties in dealing with collections when it comes to our farming members. So we are this kind of multi-purpose cooperative, which is primarily dealing with uh, lending services. In addition, our cooperative is still uh, recovering from the devastation of Taipon Bopa happened last December 4, 2012. Uh, many of our coconut uh, farmers replanted the uprooted coconut trees and rehabilitating their uh, coconut farm. Aside from coconut, uh, the local government unit also introduced the production of cacao beans as an alternative crop for those we have traditionally grown in the region. Uh, despite of all the efforts done by the farming sector, cooperative and the local government unit, the financial capability of farmers still needs to be uplifted because, of, uh, because after all, the harvest cannot satisfy the needs of a single household. So we asked the help of Grameen Foundation regarding these problems of our farmers in order to increase their morale and also help their financial capability. Through the conduct of a survey developed by our volunteer, we gather the below information pointing out the reasons of financial incapability of farmers. So one, the harvest is not enough to compensate the cost of productions. In most cases, the farmer will contact, contract a group of laborers who will do the production side of copra with an agreement of 60-40 uh, sharing of profit system, where 60% is for the farmer and 40% for the laborer group after the harvest. So this will depend on the price of the copra. And second, the farm inputs like uh, fertilizer are much expensive here in our region. So 
we usually use the synthetic kind of fertilizer that is very costly. And the third reason is that the presence of intermediaries or traders in our area. These intermediaries will buy the copra in a low price, unlike in the town traders. The farmers do not have the options instead to sell the copra in the intermediaries, where they have uh, borrowed an advanced amount of this, from these traders. Pay-in are such schemes that the traders uh, collect the interest from the farmers. So they will less uh, uh, one piso and every kilo from the farmer. And another one is that they will impose 3% of the total amount borrowed by the farmers. So the fourth reason why the uh, farmers uh, incapability in their financial is that the farmers do not have alternative product of this coconut instead of, on, uh, instead of uh, copra only. So after gathering the data, we realized that the farmer sector should be given a special concern to enable them to survive in this current situation. So before the project started, we did expect that the uh, Farmer to Farmer program of Grameen Foundation can help our farming members uh, so that they will become empowered through technologies, we think, interventions and capacity mechanism that the foundation can be extended to the cooperative and eventually to the farming members. We expect that the foundation can help the cooperative through its instrumentalities uh, for a common goal to help the farming sector. Uh, as the assignment brought by the main by the Grameen Foundation to the cooperative, it helped the cooperative to understand more the current situation of our farming members. We understand how the intermediaries manipulate the price and impose interest to the money being borrowed by the members from them. We understand uh, what alternatives also doing by the farmers when flooding seasons come. And we understand how the women also participated in the production of cacao and coconut in our regions. And a lot of informations given by our members are useful for us to better understand their situation. With the aid of our volunteer, Sir Matthew, we develop a survey form that our selected members should need to respond. Through the survey questions, we discover how difficult the farming sector here in our region. As of today, the output is presented already to the officers of the cooperative with the timelines and recommendations of our efforts now in the cooperative to mobilize our resources and potentials to meet the deliverables. As of today, we are here in the process of evaluating our midterm and also the, our long-term plan so that the recommendations from the project will be considered in crafting our plan. Hence, the cooperative don't have the research department, the F2F uh, program output instead will be very helpful for us in lieu of the research team so that, uh, suppose, we, uh, so that uh, we can uh, look into it our future plans. We can now easily make a plan out of the issues and recommendations being quoted in the project output. Hence, it was a concern coming from our members of the cooperative. As of today, through the coordination of Grameen, the cooperative sent an intention that the next volunteer assignment would be to capacitate the farming members in their financial plan of the and their financial plan. plan. Uh, we are also planning to coordinate with the secondary schools here in our region to promote cooperative and also farming as a way of food security. A long-term plan also came into our mind to consider for, uh, for the cooperative to engage in agri-training, uh, maybe 
uh, copra and cacao as one way to liberate our farmers from the traders. So to end my presentation, the farmer to farmer program bring capacity, uh, capacitating as an capacitating agent to the cooperative. It serves as an eye opener for us in the cooperative amongst those farmer members. We knew already our problems or the problems rather faced by the farming sector, but then we do not have the solutions of, uh, of the problem. But through the project, we discuss the recommendations and alternatives through the volunteer and found out that we can be a solution of the farming members when we already when we only release our potentials being a cooperative in the region. So we believe that the cooperative can help the problem of our farming members. So that's end my presentation and I would like to turn over the opportunity to our, uh, to our presenter. Hi Glenn, thank you so much for sharing your experience and pieces of learning to us. And we look forward to growing closer um, with you and your team in the next few months as we explore future partnerships with Grameen. Our other panelist is a farmer to farmer volunteer. His name is Matthew Bonapane. Matthew brings with him years of experience in lending and credit policy, underwriting, and of course, work with SMEs and financial modeling. He is also well versed in qualitative and quantitative analysis in microfinancing and small businesses. He is a CFA with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and has lived in Southeast Asia. He has spent a lot of time overseas consulting and working with microfinance institutions. So now I give the floor to Matthew. Matthew. Thanks, Christine. And hi, everyone. Um, just want to say thanks so much for joining and we really appreciate everyone tuning in. If you're a current or prospective volunteer, then I hope from what I have to say here, you'll be able to pick up some strategies that could assist you in conducting a really successful assignment. And if you're a partner of the Grameen Foundation or the Farmer to Farmer, Organ Farmer, to Farmer Organization, then hopefully um, you'll be able to witness firsthand some of the success that's been executed in these regions where help is needed. So um, as Sir Glenn pointed out, the goal of the volunteer assignment was really to develop a capacity building program that would be utilized by the staff at the organization and then would subsequently be passed down to the farmers and the other members of the cooperative. Um, Many of the farmers uh, had articulated that they were having difficulty sustaining their own financial livelihoods. Um, and really the reason behind this whole assignment is to solve that and fix that. So uh, how do you approach such a comprehensive problem that has many possible solutions and there's no one solution? Um, I think that one of the most important things for me during this assignment, and I would implore anybody working in a similar capacity to ask yourself this same question, why have you been retained? Why does this organization need an external consultant and why do they need external help? Is it because they are too engrossed in the weeds or in, in the trees to see the forest? In other words, are they too busy with the details to really see the big picture? Is it because the different members of the subject organization uh, are siloed to some extent and don't communicate with each other enough to identify the gaps in the process? Um, or do they truly need an external subject matter expert that may know more about a specific area than they do? Um, I think in this circumstance, it was probably a combination of all of those. Glamco and Sir Glenn and his management team are extremely capable and committed. Um, but particularly during COVID-19, obviously, when you've had a catastrophic typhoon less than a decade earlier, and your communities are entirely reliant on two subsectors of the agricultural sector, um, even if you are aware of the problems, it's difficult to really pinpoint 
what is a hard hitting solution. Um, and even if you do understand what that solution is, it is helpful to have somebody else come in and say, you know, yeah, I think I'm here to confirm or validate your expectations. These are the problems and these are possible solutions. So um, like Sir Glenn alluded to, this assignment in, entailed quite a few discussions between myself and the rest of the folks at Grameen and the Farmer to Farmer organization and the cooperative. So um, one thing that I would say is that there is never any substitute for those discussions. Uh, I think if you're going to be successful as a volunteer consultant or a professional consultant, you have to not shy away from spending a lot of time talking. I think that's really how you get to the bottom of what the issue is. Um, especially if you come from a professional background in consulting and you have a certain set of best practices or SOPs or, and I, I don't mean this in a tongue in cheek way, but ivory tower solutions, those definitely have a place and can be helpful, but to really learn what the issue is, you need to speak to the people who are there in the field. Um, and this was obviously an atypical situation because normally these assignments entail being on the ground uh, in person with the organization that you're working with. So this wasn't the case uh, because of the pandemic. I would love to go to the Philippines and I would love to get to meet Sir Glenn and the rest of the team in person. And that very well may happen in the future. But given that this was entirely remote, um, a different approach is necessary. And that may sound like a real handicap, but there are, there are actually pros to that situation, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. So anyway, during this assignment, um, we had tons and tons of discussions. And then uh, about halfway through the assignment, we started to craft uh, a survey that was going to be used in focus group discussions. Um, I think that is an absolutely essential component of any assignment. You need primary data collection. You can't rely entirely on secondary data. Um, so if you're going to, at any point during the assignment, put your critical thinking hat on and really get to the bottom of what the issues are, the time to do it is when you're, uh, developing a way to go about that primary data collection. So like Sir Glenn mentioned, um, there were expectations that the cooperative and myself had formed about what the problems really were. So if you're anything like me and you like spreadsheets and data, when you get that data back after the collection has concluded, it is such an exciting experience to see what people have responded, um, what the farmer members said their problems were. So from these responses and our discussions and secondary data and my professional background, I come from banking, particularly working with small businesses, um, we created a set of recommendations. So these recommendations were broken down into three main categories, uh, farmer profitability, uh, decreasing debt, and um, ensuring a funnel of talent into the agricultural subsectors um, within New Bataan in the region uh, where Glamco operates. So within farmer profitability, like Sir Glenn said, uh, the margins are too thin raw product, raw harvest um, operates on very thin margins. So oftentimes if you don't have direct market linkages, it's really hard um, to run your farm profitably if you're just selling um, raw compra or raw cacao. So we within this category of recommendations and all three of them actually broke our recommendations down into two uh, Time frames. One's short term, so accomplishable within one to four months, and uh, longer term, so four to 18 months and beyond. So, within the farmer profitability, uh, one to four months short term recommendation is to ensure that there is reasonably updated market data posted in member communities and at the Glamco headquarters so that member farmers who are selling directly to intermediaries are aware of the price they should be collecting for their harvest. Um, obviously these are very rural communities. So as I'm sure you can guess, internet connectivity is not available to every single person or most people actually. Um, so having this data available from the cooperative 
is going to be helpful. Um, the farmers need to be informed of how much money they should be earning for their for their harvest each season. So longer term, um, the recommendations really pertain to trying to vertically integrate uh, the, these subsectors and these members' farms. Uh, that sounds like a difficult task, and it really is. That's why that's a long-term one. Um, through partnerships, both private and public, the hope is that Glamco will be able to organize some post-production facilities so that rather than just selling raw cacao uh, or raw compra products, um, the intent is that maybe farmers would be able to sell their product to some sort of organization set up by the cooperative that would put their harvest through the post-production facilities and then these harvest would be sold as um, items that are further down the value chain and are going to you know, earn them a higher profit, stronger margins. In addition to that, a group logistics resource, uh, resource such as a truck, I mean, something as simple as a large truck that could ship harvest to the hubs in New Baton and beyond to be sold without needing to go through intermediaries is going to prevent some erosion of their profit. So decreasing debt is this, uh, the second main category of recommendation that we came up with. Um, based on the member responses, it, it became clear that intermediaries that ostensibly are there to help may actually be harming um, a lot of the member farmers through placing um, just an excessively high level of debt on them that is offered in a way that's going to help, but it's very difficult to repay. So obviously if you're having trouble sustaining your farm without any debt, um, barring some big change in your profitability 12 months down the line, you're going to have an even harder time sustaining your farm if you have high interest rate debt that you took out 12 months prior to that. So um, the cooperative has expertise in microfinance and that expertise should be directly offered in consultations with members before those members take out debt from these intermedi intermediaries. Um, just to explain to them, you know, hey, you're taking out a formal debt obligation. Are you sure that you're going to be able to repay this? Um, and there may, other, there may be other options. So the cooperative has a microfinance platform in place. They have a credit scoring model. They have a collateral model. They have experts in lending. Um, our recommendation was that a new product be developed through a product development cycle that is specifically aimed at refinancing uh, high interest rate debt. Uh, think of it as a debt consolidation loan, um, something similar to that, um, that will offer rate and term relief to farmers who are having difficulty getting out of debt that they took out from informal providers of debt. Um, and these informal providers of debt are, again, these intermedi intermediaries in the community. So uh, the third category of recommendation that we came up with is when you look at the results of the primary data collection that we carried out, it became very obvious that the average age of members in uh, members of the cooperative are quite old, um, high 50s, low 60s. So ensuring a uh, a pipeline of young individuals entering these agricultural subsectors is going to be important not only for productivity, but, you know, making sure that these subsectors exist one, two, three decades down the road. Um, so organizing trade events that are marketed towards youth is maybe uh, a quick hit to take advantage of that, uh, to, yeah, take advantage of the attractive aspects of the agricultural industry. Um, I think youths in these communities need to realize that there is job security definitely available in this subsector. And agritech is one of the most quick growing and attractive uh, areas of technology globally. So marketing these aspects towards youth could help bring in new talent into these subsectors, which is something that's needed in this region. Um, and I think you can move on to the next slide. So again, this slide is really kind of summing up what I said earlier about strategies that were helpful to me when you're working as a volunteer consultant with a cooperative such as Glamco. Um, when working with Glamco, 
there's microfinance considerations, there's socioeconomic considerations, uh, agricultural techniques, obviously. There's a lot to consider. Um, so before you really get caught up in, in one area, make sure that you just engage in lots of open, candid discussions to learn about the history and the challenges that are confronting management at uh, the organization that you're working with. Through these discussions, you're probably going to come up with assumptions and gut feelings that you have and uh, patterns that you notice. I think pattern recognition is very important during these conversations. And you confirm or refute these things during that primary data collection. Um, if the data collection comes back and it's completely the opposite of what you originally thought, you know, that will lead you in a different direction. If it confirms what you were thinking, that's exciting. And that's going to help inform your final product. Um, so the final deliverable for the assignment, in this case, it was the capacity building program that we developed. Uh, that's really, you know, that's your baby. That's what you put together. And um, that is going, that's going to be kind of hopefully the Bible that the organization uses um, over the coming months and years to execute on what everybody has come up with during the assignment. Um, at the same time, don't forget that this is always going to be a work in progress and you will develop this deliverable, you'll submit it, and then you will continue engaging in these discussions. And uh, it's very satisfying to see the organization continue engaging in those discussions um, afterwards. So I think that is really the main thing that I want to impart to everybody is that those strategies are important. Um, focus, focus on offering unique solutions that are catered for the subject organization and aren't necessarily based entirely on best practices, um, SOPs, things that generally work all the time because you can add value in different ways uh, aside from that. So I think that's the main thing that I wanted to impart to everybody and thanks so much for everyone's time and I'm going to turn it back to Christine now. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Glenn. It's really nice to see somebody also who gets excited with data. I, it's very similar to the work of Grameen. We're very much uh, data driven when it comes to decision making. I personally liked your statement there and encouraging more young people to be part of the agriculture space and be active in this value chain. And we hope that the organizations here um, learn from not only Matthew, but also from um, Glenn, our panelist. So as we post questions to the panelists now, we open the floor to our question and answer portion. This is more of our ex more exciting, um, equally exciting, I would say, um, part of our webinar. We encourage everyone um, here to either raise their hand or put their questions at the chat box and we will open the floor for the questions. Um, and you can address it to either Matthew, Glenn, or to both of them. So just feel free to put those in the chat box below. Let me just see if there's anybody from our chat box that has posed questions. Maybe to kick off the, the question and answer portion, uh, I'd like to address this question to Glenn. One of the most striking results of the survey you conducted was that harvests are not enough to compensate the rate cost of production of the farmers. Are there any innovative ways that Glamco is doing or planning to, the, to do for farmers to make a decent living out of coconuts? Len? Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, before, the, before the F2F program, uh, we had started already our uh, education program when it comes to disaster resiliency. So that's uh, one of our innovative way to, to increase the production of the, the farmer. But then uh, during this uh, program of the F2F, uh, we, we integrate or we are trying to connect the farmers and also to our uh, friend cooperative here in Yubataan. Uh, they are also trading uh, cacao and copra beans. Uh, cacao beans and and copra so we are trying to connect uh, both of them the the farmers and also our 
our friend cooperative so that uh, they can have the uh, better economic uh, activity in the region. Thank you, Glenn. and it, it really shows that you are open to collaboration with other organizations in the area. And yes, forward yes. to alternative sources of income as well. That's equally important for the farmers. Um, yes. Maybe this question goes to Matthew. Uh, what difference would it make if you are physically present in New Bataan to conduct the assignment? Thanks for the question, Christine. Um, I think uh, some areas of the recommendations are probably a little bit easier uh, to articulate and understand enough where your recommendations are going to be valuable. Uh, the area that comes to mind immediately is probably agricultural techniques. So I come from a finance and, and banking background, um, but I do also have a background in permaculture and sustainable agriculture. So that's an area that I feel reasonably confident in, but me trying to offer recommendations that are going to be something totally novel to individuals that work every single day in uh, coconut and cacao farming is going to be hard if I'm not there in person. So I think that's just, that's a restriction that you need to recognize up front if you're totally remote. Now, on the other side, looking at a process laid out um, from start to finish, like the process of the organization offering um, aid to its members, that's a little bit easier when you're external, I think, um, when you're totally remote. I, I actually think that after having done this, setting up an assignment where you start remote for however many months, and then you go there in person might be a really good way to go about an assignment uh, for those reasons. Thank you so much for that, Matthew. Um, we do have one question in our um, Q&A box. I, this is from um, Australia Andres, I believe from Ashi. And um, I guess this question would be for Glenn or Matthew, if you know how, how to answer this question, feel free. Would you know of a solution to the beetle infestation that kills coconuts? I think this question, would, Glenn, this might be for you, <laughs> Glenn. Yes, uh, here in the Philippines, we usually could call that coccolisap, so it can kill the coconut tree. But then solutions came across when the uh, Philippine Coconut Authority introduces the, the, the control of this. So they are inventing and continuously developing uh, a substance that can help to kill the virus. So in our community, they are practicing that and it is, uh, it is effective, by the way. So I think the, the Philippine government is doing good, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, we have one question from Christina Bolaon. I think this is from friend. One reason why intermediaries prosper is because of their immediate response to the financial needs of the farmers. May I ask how fast loans from the co-op are processed in responding to the needs of the farmers? Uh, as of the date, we are processing loan as uh, fast as one day processing time. And Sir and Glenn, I think, oh, sorry, Christine. <laughs> so, Sir Glenn, I think you had said, you, like, based on the credit scoring model that you have and the collateral sheet that you fund the same day or at least within 24 hours very often. Is that right? Yes, sir. We are using the uh, uh, credit scoring tool and also the collateral and uh, evaluating it uh, as far as uh, 24 hours, we can uh, deliver the credit to the members. Okay, we have one question from Edessa Morante of Lamco. I'm asking to Sir Glenn, the coconut harvest in your community sold 
is is copper is it copper only um no buyer for whole is there a buyer for whole coconut uh yes uh in our community the most uh the most production of coconut is copra but uh nowadays uh we can see and we can hear about the buying of whole nuts And if I'm not mistaken, those are the two different prices, correct, Sir Glenn? Yes, different prices. The, the copra is pretty higher and the whole nut is uh, cheaper. Thank you, Sir Glenn. Um, we have one question from Amelia. Matthew, can you talk more about the slim profit margins? What were the main cost drivers and were any highly variable? That's a great question. Um, one of the most expensive, actually one of the highest operating expenses that the farmers have, and I think Sir Glenn alluded to this, was the supplies that go into maintaining the farm. Um, and it's different, uh, different fertilizers that are utilized and then um, a couple of different pesticides. So because of the price of that, which I think actually has to do partially with the cost of importing it. One suggestion that came up in the uh, primary data collection was that the cooperative offer um, some sort of market at the headquarters where farmer members can come and buy these supplies that they need for the farm. Um, those supplies were really one of the biggest ways that the profit margin gets compressed. Um, and in addition to that, it's just you know, really thin margins to begin with, um, even before you get to the, the overhead of running the farm. So I hope that makes sense. And Sir Glenn, if you have anything to add to that, feel free. Yes, sir. Uh, there's nothing I can add into your <laughs> answers. I think that's a good segue to um, discussing about support and subsidies and we have one question to so that they could um have greater profit margins later on um may I, this question comes from jimmy may i know what are the existing supports provided by the local government or other agencies like pca for the coconut and cacao farmers can you so simplify the uh, Pam Christine, can you simplify the question? Um, so, it, what are Siguro? What are the existing local government or LGU provided support um, from agencies like the Philippine Coconut Authority um, for farmers in co and in coconut and cacao? Yes, got. I got it. Ah, uh, uh, right now in the Philippines, we are. Uh, uh, we can see that the Philippine Coconut Authority is extending help to the coconut farmers by uh, supporting uh, or granting uh, some inputs like fertilizer. And also there are uh, cash assistance to the uh, coconut and cacao farmers. And there are also insurances, life insurance and uh crop insurance that the government are trying to extend to the farmers so uh, it's good it's good for the government doing the this kind of help to the farmers thank you and i i think um coconut and cacao are intercrops and they can be very seasonal it, uh, and do you see any trends wherein the farmers um take in some loans uh, at higher rates or I would say in higher uh, volumes at during a particular time of the year? And if so, yes. what month is uh, Yes, uh, coconut and cacao can be intercropped. And usually in a year, uh, October or November will be a very, uh, the very high product action of, uh, of both both of cacao and the and the coconut okay thank you glenn we have one question from um the chat box what value adding technologies or collaborations has the cooperative 
explored for their commodities? Uh, value adding nowadays in the cooperative is not uh, really implemented, but we are uh, we are thinking of the virgin coconut oil and also the coconut sugar to be uh, to be introduced to our farming members. But uh, as of today, uh, the efforts and also the uh, implementation uh, it's not yet happening. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, we have one more question from Christina on the chat box. How do you deal with coconut price fluctuations in relation to cocoa farmers' loans? Yes, it is very difficult to, to, to look into that. The uh, cacao, ada, coconut, ada, copra price. And uh, we are dealing into that kind of problem uh, we will we will uh, we will talk to our member to our loaner member and uh, give them some options on their loan repayment so that these members farming members uh, will not be uh, uh, become uh, economically uh, in capability and one thing I wanted to add to that is I think I think it came up during the discussion, but um, there was maybe an option of having a subsequent assignment that focused specifically on uh, the microfinance capacities of the cooperative. Um, and I think personally, I think something that would be valuable during that is to have maybe a product development discussion where the lending the micro lending products that the cooperative has um making them have a seasonal component sort of like um anybody who also comes from a banking background should know like a seasonal working capital line of credit where during your busy months the repayment is higher because you're going to be earning more money hopefully um and during the down months maybe it's an interest only period or uh switches from monthly to quarterly payments or, or something similar to that and sorry, one thing I also just wanted to add is Amelia's question earlier about slim profit margins and the main cost drivers between those profit margins. I don't think I actually answered the component of your question about if any are highly variable. Um, I think to the extent that you can buy uh, a kilo of fertilizer and then use it for a certain, a certain amount of hectares of a... Uh, a farmland on your farm um it's going to vary based on how big your farm is but aside from that i don't know i guess i i actually don't know specifically how variable other costs are as opposed to fixed i think based on what i saw that for the most part they're kind of fixed because within these farms oftentimes there isn't a lot of external labor that's hired um it very well maybe family members where the price and the compensation that's paid to the people working on the farm is pretty flexible. Um, so, you know, a really busy season isn't going to necessarily equate to you having to pay for 20 hours of work as opposed to 10. It's a little bit more flexible than that. So that's a pretty vague answer to your question. I hope that kind of answers it. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Glenn. I think we have room for another question um, from the chat box here. And the question is, do the farmers have independent savings mobilization programs in the community? So this is for Glenn. And maybe Matthew, can, do you have any uh, views with, or observations of savings groups in the past um, that have been successful? And if yes, maybe you can share about it. Uh, yes, ma'am. From uh, on the cooperative, we, we do have the savings mobilization, but uh, I think it is it needs to be improved. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things to do when it comes to savings on the individual members. So I think uh, education also to to capacitate the members through their savings. I think. Uh, we can we can do it 
uh, so that uh, the member do have this uh, greater or big savings in the cooperative. When times of needs, they can use their savings. But as for the question, yes, we do have the savings of the individual members. I, uh, to be honest, I don't have a ton to add to what Sir Glenn said there. I, I know that the product's available from the cooperative, um, but my understanding is that a lot of a lot of the farmers there are not super able to save in a, in a huge capacity, um, especially during the last like 18 months because of the pandemic where savings have been kind of exhausted. So um, yeah, I don't really have much to add. I think for there to be savings mobilization, there has to be savings in the first place. And I think we're still building to the towards that point. Would you agree with that, Sir Glenn? Yes, sir, definitely, definitely. Uh, in fact, uh, there are a lot of uh, withdrawals of savings in our cooperative due to the pandemic also. Well, thank you so much, um, Glenn and Matthew, for those insights. I think everyone can agree that this pandemic has um, brought about a lot of uncertainties to both the private, local government, um, NGOs, and the cooperative agriculture sector. And with the insights you provided, we hope that others can learn from you and get inspired to collaborate so that we can face more challenges and um, become successful in our initiatives, both big and small, and especially for the coconut sector here who are close to Grameen's Foundation's work. We hope that we can um, encourage more people to be excited about the sector and share their solutions and ideas, both um, operational, financial, and technological. Because Grameen Foundation, we're always uh, seeking to partner with organizations that are very much aligned for as long as there's a smallholder farmer who, who is looking to improve their business sustainability, um, we would be encouraged to participate in those conversations. So thank you again, Matthew and Glenn. And now I turn over the floor to Michael. Hi, sorry. thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, go ahead, Judith. Yeah, yeah sorry, Christine. Uh, because I saw that there are a couple of questions still in the chat oh, box. Yeah, uh, this is from Francisco Elegado or Kiko. Go ahead. Um, he says maybe this is for Glenn. Are the coconut farmers fully aware of RA 1152 or Coconut Farmers and Industry Trust Fund that promises to allocate funds from the Coco Levy Fund to transform their lives uh, of the coconut farmers? Uh, Sir Glenn, yes. do you have any experience or any feedback about that? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, I heard about it, but as to the farmers level or the household level, uh, I do believe that they don't have any idea about the the the, 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 the law that we are referring to. But I heard about it, and I, I I learned some of the features about the about about the uh, extension of the government government to the to the coconut farmers. But uh, it is uh, it is a knowledge not an implementation to the when it comes to the farming members so i believe the farmer members do not have any idea about the law ma'am ma'am judith yeah thank you so much so yeah i think this is uh, another you know theme that probably we should be working on so that we can maximize the you know the the funds or the efforts uh, of the government so let me just read, Christine, sorry, I saw another question. I don't know if you can see it. You can also. Sorry, Judith, maybe, yes, I don't see other questions from my end. So maybe you can read it. Ah, all right, so this is G from Jimmy of Ashi. Aside from the fertilizer finance out of the loan, what are the other usage of the loans availed by the farmers for coconut or cacao production? So I guess this is for Glenn. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, aside from aside from uh, fertilizer, uh, there are also uh, financing that the cooperative do have. For example, rehabilitation of the farm. Example, uh, cacao and coconut. Uh, uh, replanting, rehabilitation. So we do the financing side of those uh, kind of uh, financing by the members. Okay, I think I, I see now the Q and A in the in the other box. Um, in your experience, does the government really pay for insurance during calamities? Given in that our case, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Uh, I heard about the, uh, the the insurance of the government, but as to the that the payments of the damages crop, I do not have any experience or I do not have any idea that those crops are being uh, paid by the government. Judith, do you see other questions um, that were not answered? Oh, for now, I think we have, let me just check. Um, uh, here's here's one for Matthew. Um, in your experience, can you cite some common weak points of farmer cooperatives that you have encountered? If these are different from those that, that you have mentioned earlier, how do you think um, can they avoid or mitigate this? Sorry, Judith. Can you repeat that question? I'm trying to find that here in the bot in the uh, chat box. Uh, it, it came in through the email. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. So the question is more on on the common weak points of the cooperatives that you have encountered. So uh, if these are different from those that you have mentioned earlier, uh, how can they avoid or mitigate this? So yeah, that's a question. So uh, great question. Yeah, to be honest, Glamco is the first cooperative that is specifically focused on agriculture that I've worked with directly. Um, previously, it's been microfinance institutions that have supported consumer or business lending, um, and then one that was focused specifically on manufacturing. But I think that the elements that you get between all those are probably fairly similar and i think one of the biggest ones this was a common pattern that we saw at glamco and from what i've seen in secondary data this is common at a lot of farmer communities is having open transparent access to the market that you're selling in um mitigating that i think comes down to awareness like we talked about having knowledge of what an appropriate selling prices for your harvest um, and then having direct market access because at the end of the day you need to be able to sell your harvest or whatever the product is that you're trying to transform your harvest into for a price that's going to earn you a margin that you can support yourself off of um, and if you're selling it to somebody who also needs to extract a profit from it like an intermediary then it's going to make it that much more difficult so I think mitigating it is establishing direct market linkages. And if you can't do that, then I think the end goal should be to vertically integrate. And I think with a cooperative, the goal is to do both of those. Um, just it's more possible to establish a direct linkage in the short term than it is to vertically integrate. That's obviously a longer term thing. Thanks, Matthew. I think the questions are coming in more uh, at this time. So I think we do have a couple more minutes. Um, so maybe we can answer more questions here. Just an overall question. This is from Annette. How can farmers, coconut and cacao farmers, take advantage of organic and fair trade consumer behaviors? Again, how can farmers take advantage of organic and fair trade consumer behaviors? Maybe in terms of increasing their income and becoming a niche. Maybe Glenn, do you have experience in this? 
Sorry, Glenn, you're in mute. Sorry. <laughs> I think uh, uh, based on experience, uh, organic uh, the use of organic fertilizer here in our region is being introduced and being practiced by some of our uh, farming members. But there are issues again here in uh, using this kind of fertilizer or technologies because it is more laborious compared to synthetic and farmers are usually uh, uh, usually in favor of those not too laborious in, in terms of production side. So the, the technology of organic uh, fertilizer is very good and it is also uh, uh, beneficial for our health. But uh, the more and the most uh, uh, practice when it comes to inputs here in our region is the synthetic type of fertilizer. Thank you. And this comes from also from um, the question and answer box. Do you think sustainable sourcing of coconut and cacao products should be put in place, especially involving international buyers? So or as an export quality of the Philippines. Do you think sustainable sourcing of coconut and cacao products should be put in place involving international buyers? I I do. I I definitely I I I mean I personally think that that should happen, but it's kind of the argument that if you if you write a policy for something and if you say that something's going to be a certain way, then you have to make sure it's that way. Um, so I think that doing that, and this kind of ties into the previous question about taking advantage of um, like certified fair trade, um, you know, the trend towards that. Um, the, the Philippines should obviously move towards that and that would probably make the products more attractive to a lot of buyers but at the same time consumer behaviors consumers being end consumers aren't very often buying bulk whole nut or bulk compra um so i think that yeah that's probably deserves some further discussion i think that you should do that. It's just going to not, and it probably can't be done immediately. Yes, and given that the the sector it says has multiple players, as mentioned by Glenn, from those traders to the farmers, uh, and then the actual buyers of the uh, the produce, it all involves um, everyone's effort to make that sustainable sourcing work for them and participate actively in um in that in that in, in that framework or in that system um, are the other questions judith that i have missed there's one here from i guess johnny ramos what policy framework can be possibly lobbied to national government congress or senate that a portion of the national tax allocation to LGUs due to Mandana's ruling can be channeled for microfinance <laughs> programs for, cocoa, for cacao and coconut farmers. So Glenn, any insight on that as an organization as well? As, a uh, as, of, as of today, I do not have enough information. I do not have enough experience that I can talk with this avenue. But uh, as long as for the good of, and the welfare of the coconut and uh, cacao farmers, uh, policies may be uh, one way of, of, of helping our, our farmers. But I cannot talk about what or I cannot suggest any policies that will help the Congress or the Senate or this kind of law or or policy but uh, uh, I mean I do not have any <laughs> data or idea about this uh, kind of law 
Thanks, Glenn. It's okay. I think there are others, um, other policies that might be uh, also supportive of farmers that others are not aware of. So I think this um, this puts to light the Mandana's ruling. Maybe we can research more about it as well. Uh, there's another question here. What is your opinion about the promotion of oil palm production, especially in coconut producing areas in Mindanao? So any insight on oil palm production? What are your views um, on this one? Yes, ma'am. Oil palm production is uh, also uh, uh, is also present in our region, but in our in our locality in our municipality, uh, we do not have any production of uh, uh, the palm or the palm oil. But in the other municipality, there are production of palm oil. And is that being promoted as well by your organization? Sorry, Glenn, to, to clarify. Oil palm production? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, the oil palm production is not uh, introduced by the cooperative to our to our farming members, and uh, uh, I think our farm. But as to the as to the adaptation or as to the as to the acceptance of this kind of oil palm production, I can talk. I can. I could not. Uh, I could not say that it is uh, good or it can be helpful in our locality. Okay. Um, Thank you, Glenn. I, uh, I guess... Oh, sorry, Christine. Ahead, Just one thing I wanted to say about that is things like the production of, of palm oil, um, especially in the coconut producing regions around Mindanao, um, is, you know, an area of production that's regarded as not really good for the environment. Um, and I think that addressing that and coming up with an alternative or still being able to produce palm oil, but not in kind of the destructive monoculture way that it's been done for, you know, the past century, pretty much. Um, I think the hope is that getting a pipeline of more youth talent and younger people entering these subsectors are going to make that less acceptable. Um, because I mean, if that's what you've been doing, then, mm -hmm. you know, and your livelihoods reliant on it, then regardless of the environmental impact, I think anecdotally, my impression that is that it's hard to move away from it. I think the hope is that having more young people entering into the subsector is going to make that less acceptable. Um, and that'll maybe be the impetus for these areas where it is still common uh, for moving away from that. Thanks for that, Matthew. And from our interviews with farmers, not just in Mindanao, but um, other provinces as well, I agree that there are a family, that it's really a family business for some, and encouraging young people to be active in this space early on is important um, for the sustainability of their family business. Uh, for other intercrops aside from cacao, I think that. I think they have also been exploring vegetables depending on the area and the soil quality. Um, some are doing other vegetables and um, if not vegetables, they are also raising um, livestock. So that can also be a good um, alternative sources of income um, for, and that also means being active in other cooperatives aside from those that are just coconut. And that social support system um, continues to build uh, as a network for them to face these different challenges. Uh, um, I think we have one question from Ms. Christina. How affected are the cocoa farmers in your area by the pandemic in terms of production and income? So I think this is for Glenn. Yes, so thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, in terms of production, uh, uh, during this pandemic, I think there will be no problem about the productivity. 
uh, with regards to the pandemic in our locality. But instead, the the profit or the the harvest will affect the the household here in our community during this pandemic because uh they they cannot uh they cannot go anywhere to buy something so that's it but uh when it comes to production when it comes to uh to the number of kilos every harvest there's no problem uh during this pandemic but the but the movement and the economic of the of the members is affected during this pandemic um sir glenn with and in response to that i wanted to ask things like the fertilizers and the pesticides and other supplies that are needed are they taking uh, a lot longer to be delivered to farms during the pandemic because of issues with the supply chain or is that not really interrupted? Uh, yes, sir. During the uh, first period of the pandemic, yes, it can uh, it affect. But during this time, the quarantine status is is very much. Uh, uh, I mean, the quarantine status is not so strict. So the fertilizer coming from the town can be delivered into the farm in the most convenient way of, uh, in the most convenient and the most uh, uh, less time of delivering the, the inputs. So I think there's no problem when it comes to the inputs from the market to the, to the farm. So it, it, it cannot affect itself. All right, thank you so much, Glenn and Matthew. Um, this has been a very fruitful conversation, uh, lots of exchanges from our, our, our guests as well. So I'm glad that um, we have a very active audience this morning. I mean, nighttime for some of you folks. Um, and thank you again for sharing your views and opinions and pieces of learning throughout your journey as a volunteer, Matthew. And of course, Glenn, for providing us your um, time and um, expertise as well from the cooperative sector. I now turn over the floor to Matthew, I'm uh, sorry, to Michael um, for our closing remarks. Michael. Thank you, Christine. Uh, before we conclude today's webinar, we would like to acknowledge a few more organizations that joined. Uh, so we have Sir Edwin Pasahol, for, uh, he is the Chief of Program Development of the uh, Bureau of SME uh, Development. And we also have uh, folks from Maimatan Farmers Co uh, Multipurpose Cooperative, uh, Yaka Patalik Multipurpose Cooperative, case in one. Uh, we have folks from World Wi Wildlife Fund Philippines. Uh, we also have empowering communities with hope and opportunities through sustainable initiatives, Ecosea, Franklin Baker, and Phil Seaboard. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks, a big thanks again to the panelists and thank you to all the participants for the excellent, excellent uh, questions. As we all know, it's a challenging time across the globe, but the effort the volunteers uh, put into helping communities, even from another part of the world, is really inspiring. And uh, we hope to continue making a positive impact during the pandemic, even remotely. If there are any more questions that didn't get answered uh, during the uh, session, please feel free to email us and we will try to answer them. Um, again, thank you so much, and I hope the audience was able to gain some valuable um, insights of our efforts through the Farmer to Farmer program, especially during this difficult time. Please stay tuned for updates and information about the next webinar, and uh, a recording of today's webinar will be available and will be sent to all participants. For more information about available projects, please visit bankersofthoutborders.com slash volunteer. You can also shoot us an email at gf underscore f to f at grameenfoundation.org, or you may visit us on Facebook by typing f to uh, by typing fb.com slash grameenbwb. Again, on behalf of F2F Corpus, thank you, stay safe, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.